We're live. Welcome everyone to Table Talk, where we talk all things tabletop. I'm your host, The Ballet Gamer, with my co-host, Glue Boy. Hello, hello. And our wonderful guest. You can go ahead and inter- introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm James Case. I'm senior designer at Paizo, working on all sorts of Pathfinder stuff. Uh, uh, I was the lead on Dark Archive, and I currently am working on the Tiensha books. I was the lead for Howl of the Wild, which comes out, and uh, doing wrapping up a little bit of stuff with War of Mortals. So, yeah. Yeah. Ooh, exciting. Yeah, lots of let's go. Cool also, uh, anyone in the chat, let me know if the music's too loud. For some reason, it seems loud to me, even though I put it literally as quiet as possible. But it's always weird. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. I'm very ex- man. This year, let's see what came out last year. Is mostly just Rage of Elements. Rage of Elements. And yeah. Player the... Core One uh, at the end of the and year. The... And the GM core came out, and I and think, core. yeah, I can't quite remember what the Lost Omens books that year were. I think it's hard. It's like the uh, the last couple lands. years have felt like several years. So yeah, uh, you know, we joke our sense of time is is pretty messed up at this point. So yeah, and I remember I, I remember seeing uh, like your name credit on uh, Dark Archives, which I gotta say, thank you because that book rules. <laughs> Thank you. I, I I adore that book. Like I, there's a couple books published in in Pathfinder that I hold near and dear to my heart. Like my top three is Guns and Gears, Dark Archives, and the Mwangi Expanse. I adore those three books a lot because like they're so fun to just browse. I'm not a guy to sit down and read books much anymore. My attention span's a little uh, not great, but those books are fun to page through. They have great stuff. And like, some of the additions are are so much fun. It's a lot of something that uh, I think I really like to credit to Logan. You know, who mm-hmm. I think with something like Secrets of Magic, he really wanted the books to be, you know, not just you know 120, 200 pages worth of just kind of spells all the way through. He wanted it to be like, what's the sort of story? What's the meta conceit of this book? Like, why is this a thing you want to? read through and i think you know every project that's a little different for you know i think guns and gears is really great because it it separates things into like all of those chapters because those are things you might want to add sort of piecemeal to your campaign you know rage of elements has that like convocation where there's all of the different elements Mm -hmm. going on uh and then so for dark archive i was like okay i want this to be really i don't want this to be cohesive because if the theme is paranormal it's like the more you know about it the like more the sense of mystery kind of wears off, right? So yeah, mm-hmm. like a scattered shot. I was always going to be like a lot of scattered notes more than like an authoritative treatise sort of thing. Which mm-hmm. is what hits really fun. And also that it hits because like it works for the two classes really well because psychic, it works really well. And then thaumaturs, especially the entire idea is going in on your sometimes maybe dubious knowledge <laughs> on entities. I mean, I'm, I'm straight up building a character that is operating off of intelligence, actual recall knowledge. Nah, man, pure vibes. Okay, I'm kind of faking it out. It's, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a fun class. I am. Um, so cool. I like when it came out, people just kind of, I think at the time, Mark Seifter, who was the, he was the primary design on that class. Uh, I think he had like a, a form thread where it's just like name anathemas and what you use them for. And it's just, it was just like people jamming out lists of like, okay, well, this is a lion and this is a rusted, you know, this is a rusted trap or something. So I use it to, you know, invoke its weakness kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. I'm actually currently playing Athometers in our uh, Kingmaker game. And I love it, especially with the, I'm pretty sure, unintentional combination you can have with Magus with a uh, raised tome and the tome implements. Sure. Okay. Yeah. That sounds fun. It's. It, I mean, it's. It's, it's a. It's essentially a, a sword and board thaumaturs using their the tome. Using your book. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Plus, it's it's fun being the recall knowledge character in a game because you get all the juicy facts for your team. Yeah. It's. I. I like the very much the kind of active use of 
sort of weird casting implements. You know, I, mm. I just think it brings a lot of flavor. Yeah, well, and the class is so dynamic, how you can approach just your toolkit in general, like the scroll esoterica, having extra scrolls every day, or even the fact that the class is, it's got one of those features, the demons, where you can just have a, a secret hideout, and then eventually you can teleport with wherever <laughs> you need it to. Really, really fun. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, there's been a lot, and in, in I, I think anyone at this point could say that Paizo is insane with how much you guys put out all the time. And I mean, Pathfinder's a lot. Like, I we're just in the Pathfinder here for the most part, though I do plan on transitioning to Starfinder when Starfinder gets, you know, a lot more stuff that I can really uh, bite into. And I'm sure that's also going to be a ton, a metric ton of books and stuff. And it's making me sweat a little because I know <laughs> it's, it's going to be very busy. But I'm also very excited. I'm also just very excited to see uh, the Pathfinder 2E kind of formula put in Pathfinder or Starfinder because Starfinder's always looked really, really cool. But me personally, and I know my co-host as well, get a little hung up on the the kind of more crunchy rules of, of first edition. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to look at... I've seen the playtest in very kind of fragmented mm. uh, pieces, and I'm kind of I'm interested to kind of sit down and look through it a little more cohesively now that I have a little bit of time. So are you um, involved at all with the Starfinder 2nd Edition at all, or are uh, you mainly with Pathfinder? Uh, me, not so much, um, just because of the books that were sort of... You know, we have... A number you know the rules and lore team is pretty big but at the time where all of these were in motion um i was pretty heavily doing the tantra books and howl and also i did a couple of the um for the remaster i was uh handling a couple of the classes and other parts of the system there i was uh i was kind of the lead on remastering the witch and the Drood and the wizard, me and Logan kind of split a little bit, just depending on how things were going. So it, it all just kind of broke out to the fact that I, was, uh, I wasn't I was as involved in, in the uh, Starfinder stuff. So mm. The sense. witch was brilliant, by the way. I think, I think it was a really good fix that made it stand out a lot better uh, than it had before. Granted, I really liked witch before as well. It's always been, it's always been a really popular class, and I think it I think it just needed a, th a little bit of a tune-up in a couple places. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were supposed to be out their familiars, so we were just like, well, they should get something unique with their familiars. And, um, you know, I I really like the kind of more... I, I both like very magic treated as a science in general, where, like, mm -hmm. you know, people are talking about this rune increases spell output by, like, 0.35 in this case, mm -hmm. but I also really like uh, very abstract kind of folk magic, mm -hmm. uh, and that's more on the witch side. And then also we had like uh, Simone Sully and Shay Snow uh, are both like just very knowledgeable about folk magic, witchcraft, that sort of thing in general. So at one point I did go to them and I was just like, brainstorm with me. <laughs> Let's, uh, what are some witchy things we can't do yet? So like this, uh, the ceremonial knife was one of those where they were Ah, oh, that's like, a good you know, one, yeah. Yeah, because on a on a design level, we were like, well, the witch needs a little bit more, needs a little bit of a boost in terms of how many spells they can cast per day. We were like, mm -hmm. okay, well, we need something that is some flavor of spell spell battery. Uh, and then I think it was Simone who was like, well, you know, knives are a thing, but they're not supposed to be weapons. They're supposed to be conduits for energy. And we're like, okay, well, that that's a wand, so we can they can just have a knife wand. Uh, yeah, and I think that's so a was... really cool idea. I think that. Uh... That I always, I mean, to be fair, I'm a big Gish fan. I'm always like, give me Marshall in my spell casting, please. <laughs> and that's a that blends the idea in a very good way. That's not inherently super Marshall focused, but has a <laughs> flavor which I particularly At least they have it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I'm directly operating with the uh, the wizard stuff since I'm, we're we're doing our uh, Pathfinder live play um, every week, and 
I was eyeing up the remaster pretty heavily since like we were all going through it ready for the prep because uh <laughs> before everything I was playing a tiefling wizard okay and so it was basically while I was watching everything it was just oh is oh, my entire sheets changing right <laughs> what's happening and then now I'm I'm playing with it and a little like, bit Let's it doesn't feel like I definitely was joking more. Like I, I am, I am playing a new character. It's, it's the new version of this man, ship of Theseus, my, my wizard <laughs> William Crowley, but uh, more or less, he just has more options. And at the very least, the only tangible feeling I gotta say is picking my spells and my spell repertoire feels a lot nicer. Well, that's just, nice. <laughs> which is something that I know was some like random stuff I kept seeing online people worried about and then and actually picking it going with the war school playing like a blaster caster in practice everything worked a lot smoother and I was just seeing a lot of nice spells like available to me I like I always like when the I always like when the kind of classes are a little more open like in the sense of you know, with the eight schools of magic, I think some of them worked really well. You know, I, I really like when we moved healing back into necromancy, mm -hmm. for instance. And I'm like, yeah, it's like force manipulation. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're, like, turning people into skeletons. Right. But also, you know, for a long time, I'm like, illusion and enchantment are very similar in what they end up doing. It's just a question of whether it's like, I make you think you saw a zebra or whether I make an image of a zebra here. But... Mm -hmm. The end effect is is very similar so those are always ones that like i felt you could kind of mush together a little more which is i think where like some of the mentalism stuff came from mm -hmm. i mean it definitely has i think more than anything it has opened up the idea of what college your wizard actually went to rather than feeling more like a field specialist which while is also good i think having more of like an established like college you came from or like school of training is a lot better for building backstory than yeah. being a specialist because that's that can be incredibly self-contained depending on how you how you design your character yeah and i like that we we can add more later we're not kind of metaphysically limited to eight and then one forever mm -hmm. you know um that'll be fun uh, I do know of a couple that are coming, but I'm not going to talk about them yet. Ooh. So <laughs> they're not in my books, so I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, I kept fair. joking. I kept joking that I really wanted. Uh, I really wanted to just say like, like, we had another page. I would just add like a goblin one, and all it is is just all the fire spells, but then also the one that's like, like desiccate or something because they also like pickling or something like that. So I was just, <laughs> oh, like, that's fun. That would be really yeah. fun. I think that'd be good fun, but unfortunately. Uh, that was the core book and not like an all about goblins book but like mm. i'm gonna do it one of these days and somebody's gonna forget to stop me so <laughs> that's that's, that's something the... we heard uh <laughs> when we talked to michael sayer i i well, Mike a... is the king of that so <laughs> i i had a theory when it comes to a lot of this because uh it, it's something as as a as a creative as as a i come from a film background I, I enjoy myself art in any creative pursuit that I can feel the hand of the author and like whoever is touching this piece had a big smile on their face as they were writing something. That's like my favorite thing in the world and there's so many times I'm reading a Paizo book and it feels like someone is writing and no one was in the room telling them stop and then uh, I was told directly that was the case for a large portion of certain uh, things. Problem. I always say that, you know, like, I'm very cognizant of the fact that you know, we we do have a brand, we do have a brand voice. Like, I think it's important mm -hmm. that everything oh, kind yeah. of feels like it's in the same world. But I'm also of the like, so like, keep that in mind, but A, be enthusiastic about it, and B, you get one. You get like one, why is this in the book? <laughs> and, like, it's in the book because I wanted it to be in the book, you know? Mm -hmm. be, be tasteful about it, but you do get one. <laughs> Is kind of where I am on that. That's so fun. Um, actually, before we get in started, uh, tell us a little bit about like your journey with Paizo and like how you came to be and kind of what you like about your job. Just to kind of preface everything before we move into uh, yeah, all the books. So, um, I came into Paizo as an editor, uh, and then um, 
Uh, I mean, like, I, I looked at my, like, you know, I was, uh, I came in on, like, a 3-5 D&D, and then me and mm -hmm. my friends started playing. We played a lot of fourth, and we also started playing a lot of Pathfinder at the same time. So I think I actually had the alpha playtest in a Paizo account that was linked to, like, my high school email that I had to have customer service linked to, like, an actual email account that I have now when I joined the company. Um, I worked in uh, scientific editing overseas for about four years. Um, I lived in Tokyo, so I did a lot of like editing of like papers and that kind of thing. And then uh, I wanted to move back stateside, try and work in games. So I came in as an editor. I worked with um, like Judy, Liz, uh, all those people from that era who are really who are all just really awesome. Uh, I was in Pathfinder Society for a while there, uh, around the first, second, I don't think I was into the third year. And then after that, I came onto the design team around the time we were working on Secrets of Magic. So I've been there for about that, that much time. Uh, and at some point, I became a senior. I couldn't tell you when <laughs> yeah. at that point. Uh, so I've been at Paizo about six years now. Um, uh yeah, and in that time, you know, I've gotten to do so a lot of writing on a couple of things. You know, I did the third Fist of the Ruby Phoenix uh, AP. Oh. Um, I've done a couple of Monsters of Myth, like To Heal I, and uh, I did some of the stuff with Talja with Joshua Kim, which was really cool. Uh, and just little pieces here and there kind of over the <laughs> over the course of the of the edition. Uh, and then other than that, I've, I do... I've done some freelance game stuff, and I've also done some freelance uh, media translation, uh, like anime and music kind of stuff, just for a couple of companies. Yeah. Um, now I am mostly, like, now I'm mostly uh, doing, you know, the hardcover rule books and the design consults for, you know, some of the Lost Omens and that kind of thing. Uh, that has to be a very significant, I guess, change from your time starting not too long ago, honestly, to now working on, like, most of the hardcover stuff and, like, most of the very player facing content where a lot of people get to see it yeah i mean the the when i was in editing i mean the editing team really does touch everything mm -hmm. but it's it's very holistic um you know then i did adventures for a while and now i do more con more more rules content although at the same time you know also one of the reasons like dark archive has for instance it has like a mini campaign through it and of the dead does as well so we do kind of go into that at some points but um certainly i'm working in a lot more of a of the sort of specialized project as opposed to just kind of on whatever is happening uh which editing is very broad right mm -hmm. that's very fair uh i i don't know i've always been into tabletop myself and i was like man this game would be kind of cool if i did this that or like i always run games but i am so adverse to writing for no good reason i my my gm style is completely improv i never come with a plan i'm just like all right here we go i'm just gonna tell a story based on vibes and you know it works for me but there's a lot of times where i like i started i'm working on my own game thing right now and i've been typing and i've gotten like two pages done in like a week and a lot of it's just because I've been super busy, but it's also just like, it's very hard for me to sit down and just type words. And it never comes out exactly the way I want, probably just because I don't write. So it's like it. Uh, writers will be the writing. first. Writers will be the first people to tell you that writing is terrible. That That's yeah, for sure. I guess it's fair. <laughs> yeah, I saw, I think the best picket sign I saw during the writer's strike was uh, something to the effect of. Like we're writers, we cannot write for as long as we want. You don't know us, something like that. <laughs> True. <Yeah. laughs> I've, I haven't written anything in months. A few more. My water. dishes are very clean though, so there is Fair. that. Yeah. Doing true. everything possible <laughs> for the one thing. I mean, at every oh, it artist field, it's the uh, uh, any film, short film or video I've ever produced. I'm also the first person to be like, yeah, and then we could have done this better, this better, this better. This, I wish I did it this way. Other people watch it be like, it was fine. Like, <laughs> eh, don't say that. It's not true. Uh, and actually, right before we get into it as well, uh, I want I, I want to ask Ken like, what is your personal like tabletop style? Like when it comes to tabletop RPGs, like what do you what, what do you enjoy? What do you like? What do you like to do? 
Um, I mean, I I do like a little bit of a crunch. I do like a little bit of a crunchier system, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I like. And when I GM, it's just very like I'm like here are here's the basic, what I think is gonna happen. There are some stat blocks. I am prepared for this to just go off the rails. So mm, like you're gonna have to. Yeah, there is one where it, and I I am a I am a big fan of like, okay, here is an NPC, and then like, like here is the NPC they're gonna they're gonna face, and instead they just kind of like my players just obviated the encounter and pieced out of the dungeon. I was like, this NPC will be coming back in one session with a different face. They came back and then got killed in a hit, and I was like, this NPC is gonna come back with a different face way later. <laughs> um, I'm like, I can just that can just be whatever. So. It's like a very like laying the track in front of the train walls and grommet style, but it's also a little more like I'm like, I'm like the PCs don't know what was supposed to be in that room. They don't know the treasure was supposed to be in that room. The treasure could be in whatever the next room they find is. Uh, whatever room they actually decide to look through. Yeah. I'm like, is this room narratively appropriate? And did they struggle to get there? Then maybe it should have a gem in it or something. Yeah, yeah, I think it's very important to reward players. So you're mostly a GM style of a person, or do you like playing equally or more? Yeah, I haven't, well, I unfortunately haven't played in quite some time because I'm, uh, just for so long it was very difficult to meet in person, and I just mm. found it difficult to play a lot of stuff online. Like, uh, I think I had a couple of ETT games that were, like, uh, that I think worked uh really well and like the vibe was good but i think for other games and other systems it's just like or even certain groups it's just a little harder i think um i am playing a i am playing a 5e planescape game right now actually oh. uh every so often in which i am playing a, which I, in which i am playing a halfling monk which is the first time i've played a character in a little bit which is good fun so other than stuff like in office play tests and such which is a little more that's fun, but that's also, you know, we're all sitting down with our notepads and stuff, so. Right, yeah. Playtesting yeah. uh, has some different goals. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I'm lucky. My my fiancé is running games for me now, so I get to I get to play. But I also love being the GM because it's, uh, uh, like, I have a little bit of ADD, and it's, like, having a whole world to manage at a time is the proper amount of stimulation for <laughs> this kind of stuff. Because playing as a player, it's fun, but sometimes, like, it's just not my scene or whatever. And my brain just kind of, you know, goes off in the la-la land unintentionally as best as I try not to. Because I just, I need that constant stimulation. So being a GM really works for me well. But, uh, all right. So, we're, we're about at the time where everyone's hopped in now. Let's talk about, uh, well, let's talk about Tian Shack because that's going to be the next book coming out. And also has another book coming out in August. Yes, so the World Guide is coming out on the 24th, although I think the warehouse has just started shipping. So like, starting to see that sort of trickle out. Um, so that's our big, I have it actually, I have it right here. Ooh, ah, you got yeah, a fancy one too. I do, yeah, they gave me both. Um, so this is just like our big gazetteer into the world and that kind of thing. And it's just to delve into each of the nations. Oh, this is the one that was in this week's fiction, which I really like is Tung Mai. Mm -hmm. I love those nation panels. Those, uh, I love using that kind of stuff where it's like, here's the yeah. settlement level and here's what they trade in and everything like that. It's Pathfinder's got a really good system with having that where it's like, okay, so you can get item level, character item level up to this or half if they don't have the thing and it works super well to know like what players can and cannot access but it's also cool to see like the things you don't expect like oh this place gets a lot of, like food products while this one doesn't so how does that affect the like local economy yeah and it, it's just like a good way to open the chapter as well it just like kind of mm -hmm. sets it off and you have a nice piece there and all that so it both like sets up the chapter and also doubly serves as a really helpful resource as like a quick i am mid game open up uh i have the answer you can close the book get back to playing or it's a perfect primer for the chapter just get the vibe yeah yeah get the vibe. Um, so we have that uh that is mostly a lauren setting book um there are some player options in the form of like 
deities, there's a couple of rituals, but it's mostly for like setting and setting grounding, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And then in August is the character guide, which is um, a bunch of new ancestries, a bunch of expansions, uh, to existing ancestries, um, also stuff like new archetypes, new class feats, items, all that. That's like very the character option book. So all here was very much like, you know, uh, you have a the lore book comes out and you have a sense to kind of see what's in the setting, see what kind of grabs you and what inspires you. Uh, and then then, you know, once you've kind of had a chance to digest that, then you have the character book with all of the options you have to kind of make a character from that nation now. Mm hmm. Yeah. And so uh, I, I'm actually really curious because the, the Mwangi book came out and I think Impossible Lands as well. They came mm -hmm. out as like whole books. You know, they didn't have mm -hmm. like a world guide and character guide. Uh, yeah. But this one did. So is there any particular reason for it or did it just feel like this one was going to be a lot more character heavy? So having a smaller character guide was more efficient than having like one big book. Yeah, I think first of all, we're kind of always trying out presentations, um, mm. so it's it's not it's not necessarily always that uh, every time we do one region, we're kind of going to do this much. You know, we have, uh, for instance, you know, we've done something like Absalom is one kind of meta region that was an even I think that was an even larger book than this one. They may be about the same size as was Impossible Lands, but we also had the a kind of framework of this is sort of an entire continent where even though it's a different Wang Expanse is, you know, it's a very culturally specific mm -hmm. setting, of course. Um, it is kind of a little bit of a geographically smaller area. Um, this was a little bit larger. It was sketched out. The kind of definitions of it were sketched out in first edition. You know, we had the, the Dragon Empire Gazetteer already. Um, we knew we really wanted to go in depth with it. And at the same time, a lot of the, we had a lot of ideas for options and we kind of thought you know, in the same way how we have kind of like a player, a player guide and a, and a GM guide, it's not quite the same thing, but you know, the, if we had kind of put everything together, the book would have been a little untenably long. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so it felt like, um, we wanted to really dive into each one of the nations and there are quite a good number of them uh, in this book and then you know also when we had it we thought you know deities there's some who have like never been illustrated for instance so we kind of had that stuff as well but at the same time we were like we can get it we want to do at least three ancestries and then we also have you know a couple more we can do and um you know, just asia is a very large region you know it's uh mm -hmm just a geographically large continent it has a lot of people it's very culturally diverse and that's not not true of any of the other kind of regions we've looked at just because of the way this was structured we sort of had a lot to cover at once as it was mm -hmm. yeah so this is more of a this situation warranted having two books to keep it a bit more cohesive less than like this isn't the plan for every world guide going forward. Uh, yeah, and in the same way how, you know, uh, we had the best area and then we had Book of the Dead and that had a specific framework and then Howl of the Wild has a different framework. We didn't really, we don't really feel the need to sort of create a hard format for every single book that happens to kind of look like it's in a given kind of type, and, you know, unless that's working. Uh, in which case, yeah, by, you know, the uh, those intro page formats are very similar to what we've done in all the other Lost Omens books, for instance. But, um, yeah, you know, if we get to another region uh, and it needs to be very large for region, we might do that. If we get to a continent and it's, you know, not a, like a saga of books, we might do that. It just kind of depends on what is sort of right for the project and the timeline and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think that's the reason why these books are so interesting. Even like for other tabletop games uh I, and just books in general i'm not like one to sit down and read like i said it's not fully my thing but what makes them so fun like these just pathfinder releases whenever they happen even for like world guides or even like gm material stuff as someone who only plays i don't gm at all not my vibe i'm not a fan of it in the slightest uh I like picking up books like this because it's what you said earlier when we were talking about uh, Dark Archive, 
having every book follow a different format fitting the theme leads to each one having a different feel to it almost like it's yeah. its own little contained story in a way or like it, you're it's a world guide in following almost people actually like exploring a world because it seems like the uh how the wild is i mean following an investigation team vibe too. i've described it as 50 percent jules verne book 50 percent david attenborough documentary 50% Disney's Atlantis, which is itself based on Jules Verne, and 50% the beginning of Up. Yeah. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't catch the Up bit from any of the, the material, like the stream or the blog stuff. I did kind of just, immediately kind of just the vibe of having like a, kind of just the vibe of having like a guy going on an adventure when he's already a senior citizen. Yeah. You know. It, it looks really fun. Like the, the group just traveling out, seeing what they discover writing it all down like it's gonna be another book that i'm excited to read through and also uh probably play a minotaur in the coming future it'll be fun yeah um simone Sully has done a lot of internal fiction for that uh, and she's also been the one doing the um the web series that's going on right now as well and i think she uh baron that is is very has a lot of her you know, handprints all over it and i just really like him as a character in that and all the rest of the crew were kind of each done by a different author and they all have very they're all a little they're all a little uh extra is not the right word but they're all Quirky. like they're all a little they're all a little eccentric in their own way yeah mm. and i like that uh, i like that vibe they feel like uh they feel like an adventuring party yeah you know, they're all a little <laughs> weird it's the it's the baldur's gate quote from a staring i keep thinking of like i can't tell if one of you've been replaced because i'm surrounded by weirdos <laughs> it's like that that sums it up for any like adventuring group yeah i you know honestly pathfinder has been one of the funnest companies to kind of collect books from one because the art's always really good and all the books are very interesting i i definitely can appreciate like how mixed up it can be where it's like oh this book has a very linear kind of format like the core books obviously oh, a lot more linear a lot more to the point but a lot of the other books like dark archives are just so packed with flavor in every margin there's so much stuff that you can find and rage of elements i think is a, also another book that's really really so it's such a colorful book when you're flipping through it you can find yeah. just where you are in the book by the general color scheme you can find just like you know you're in the fire book because all of the borders are now on fire yeah. you know it's great <laughs> it's uh, good uh, that has those really nice like kind of almost like color pencil sort of type illustrations mm -hmm. opening the element chapters which i i really like just as a it makes it feel very painterly which is cool mm -hmm. and you know it, that's a that's something that like it comes from a bunch of people who have a lot of creativity like almost unbound creativity to to make all this stuff because i've seen like i see a lot of tabletop stuff i've been doing tabletop stuff for a very long time and there's a lot of times i've, I've looked at something and it's usually because i have a small team as well but i looked at something and it's like this feels very dry like i understand what you're making and i understand that the idea is fun but it doesn't feel like it's being developed for a story it feels like it's being developed to play and a lot of Pathfinder stuff inherently comes across as there's some deeper narrative kind of going on in the background. And the rules, even though it's definitely a crunchy game, it it's a crunchy game that leans so much more towards narrative than other more like crunchy games tend to. I don't have any sort of philosophical problems with the words uh, crunch or fluff, really. Like, I think that's mm -hmm. fine. But I... Do you think that it can sometimes miss the fact that the flavor description is itself part of the mechanics? You know, yeah. if you like, this is a, this is a game that is ultimately adjudicated by uh, human beings Im improvising around a table or a VTT or what have you. And you know, if the ability is fundam if the ability is fundamentally deal ten damage to one character within thirty feet, like that's the most broken down version of that. You know the the difference between you shoot a laser and it deals 10 damage to somebody within 30 feet or like you stomp the ground and rocks fall on them it's like that first 
that first line is important to how you you bring that ability to life in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were talking with Michael last month, and Michael's very much an advocate of, uh, you know, having the rules support the narrative is kind of like a main mm -hmm. design philosophy. And that's something that I, I very much kind of lean towards advocate for is, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, what makes tabletop tabletop is it's narrative gaming. It's the ability to tell your own story, but have guidelines and rules to support that so that what you what you create is something of substance rather than just like fantasy, you know, like writing a book would be. And that's very evident in what Paizo does. Uh, as far as like the Tian Sha stuff, it, uh, as much as you can talk about, because I know a lot of it's still coming out. Uh, what has been some of the funnest parts of working on these two books? Um, a lot. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is this really was a, a thing that you know Eleanor and I have wanted to do for like a re for like a really long time. You know, we both joined the company about at about the same time. We were part of that big. We got hired for P2, and we didn't know it until the first day after we had signed our NDAs. Mm -hmm. uh, wave, you know, um, you know, both of us are mixed race Asian. Both of us have a lot of eyes to this, and we were like, it would be really cool to do this kind of thing in this system. We could do this, and so we just had like kind of a bunch of notes. And then when it came time to put on the schedule, we're like, okay, okay, we're gonna do it now. Um, uh, it was really cool to kind of plot the books out to get. Just like a really, really huge number of authors from just across the industry, almost all of whom are, you know, of Asian descent mm -hmm. uh, and who have very different specializations in various things, you know, from uh, people who, you know, have like more of a linguistics background, from people who, you know, have done a lot of storytelling to people who have done kind of their own games in this space. And we just kind of put together an Avengers team. It was really cool um everybody had just very different takes on a lot of the material and it was just a number of times i was reading through something and i was like in like milestone feedback or development pass or design pass and i was like i would have never i would have never come up with this i don't don't understand don't understand the full like arc of what um yaogui for instance are mm -hmm. a Aogui and Wayangs are both like very highly culturally specific. Um, and I don't know as much about those mythologies, but in like reading through them, I also learned a lot about those mythologies in the process of like, how could we adapt this to our game? You know, uh, thing for like Wayangs, uh, we had uh, Tan Shaohan did a lot of the lore and consulting on that. And then, you know, like months later, he he was in the Project Discord and he's like, like I'm at a workshop for Wang puppetry. Huh. Like, here it is. Um, and so we just worked together to be like, okay, this is a thing that they are often associated with in their in their myths. Uh, you know, they can draw power from darkness or something. So they have an ability where if they're in darkness, they can like recharge a focus point or something, that sort of thing. Or just like, it's fun to sort of fit the pieces together um there are also some just really wild adventure hooks uh in, in this book um good yeah my my favorite has the uh as i've referred to the mecca king huang uh succession crisis which is mm -hmm. the emperor who uh is dead has a succession crisis going on amongst his like large number of of children i think one of the one of his daughters is by far the most competent but the problem is all of the other siblings know that she's very competent so whenever she gets like too close to sort of winning the succession game they all gang up on her um and then of course king huang is uh resting in an immortal construct body somewhere waiting to re-emerge so it's like this whole thing going on there's there's all sorts of just really out there adventure hooks and that sort of thing i i love books with good adventure hooks uh one of my favorite books from animal beyond fantasy uh, as crazy as that game is was their world book because the book was filled with endless amounts of inspiration for storylines because it's like every region like they just have like a paragraph or two per like area little thing 
and then they come with a couple of adventure hooks at the end and every time i read a chapter i was like well i have a new idea for a game or i have a new idea for what the players could do in this area and that's something i really really enjoy personally as like someone who likes to dm so it's really cool to hear that you guys have some cool stuff hiding in there in the book it's also just nice to have the chance to illustrate a lot of different things um there, you know, we got to do some in-house concepting with Kent, which is just always, always so great. Kent is fantastic. Um, and the sort of, sort of visual storytelling there. Um, there's also a lot of like types of either architecture or motifs or costumes that I think don't, don't show up, I think, in Asian inspired media in the West quite as often. Mm. Uh, and so it was, um, we had something where it's like this is for instance this is something japanese that's like pretty common you'd see a lot but then there's another part it's like this is specifically very ainu um just because why not uh, let's we have you know it's a large book we have a lot of art in it so put that through and then we also have one where it's like these are people who live in the desert uh they are very fantasy forward um this is the like this is the descendants of sort of the crash shori flying city so like I think Kent was like, well, they have this like ancestral connection to air magic and they live in the desert. So they probably wear a lot of very loose flowing clothing so they can feel which way the wind is blowing. Uh, and also because deserts change temperature really quickly, you know, between day and night. So they probably need to be able to, oh, it's night. I need to be able to put four more layers on now versus, oh, now the sun's rising. So I need to be able to like take a bunch of layers off. That's so cool. I love cultural stuff being implemented in fantasy because it makes it feel so much more lived in and i think also high fantasy and fantasy in general i think is kind of plagued by many tropes that have kind of just grown old over time of the tolkien stuff a lot of the the fantasy stuff that's going to come up over time uh so having stuff that's a lot more culturally based a lot more like just looking at the people in different areas is something i always advocate for a hundred percent and like and those tropes are really cool you yeah, know like uh, you know i i love me a good uh super long-lived elf i just finished watching all of free run it was so good free run's so good uh, i i love the like, characterization like yeah the alienness of living for a bajillion years it's great um i need to still watch that i, I plan to watch that after highly recommend highly recommend it's really good is, uh whatever's currently on uh delicious and dungeon so I can, oh, no. like I'll watch my two like big fantasy anime like yeah, yeah. right after each other. Uh, you know, and then you have something like, you know, uh, like High Helm for instance, where it's like we had you know dwarves, metal they have stone they have brewing, but like I remember in that again Kent had like all the different dwarf, uh, like dwarf clans and like how their kind of like daggers and clothing and stuff was a little bit different based on what they specialized in, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one. Well, I love uh, in the Mwangi that what they did with the Terlu dwarves and the uh, the other ones as well. Can't remember yeah, at the moment. Yeah, the are the they're the really technicolor ones. I think. Uh, Is that the right one? I, I might. I, 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 I'm getting yeah, confused. I love them though. I like I like the I like the ones that dye their beards like yeah, the yeah, color yeah. The sky. That those are my favorite. Uh, but both of them are really cool. The ones that I. Is it the Terry there with the Sky Dragons? I can't remember. Uh, I have my book. I'm like, don't cite me on this one. I don't. <laughs> uh, contrary to popular opinion, uh, the designers and developers do not have an encyclopedic knowledge of every single product yeah. in their head all the time. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. Like, I mean, not even the fact that you're working on different projects. Also, the fact that, especially if you're editing or just working on stuff, your brain's already locked in on like a couple things or a vast amount of things. Yeah, and we, you know, we we kind of we ship the book and then we sort of don't don't think about it as much for a couple months, yeah. and then it starts to come out, and then we're like, okay, well now it's time to, you know, now we're doing kind of the next stage. Now we go back and we look at it, and then like it's out, and then we're responding to that. But like, definitely comes and goes in like wave similarly like when you assign the book and then it's out being written you know we're usually writing as a separate thing at that time so we tend to have a lot of things in rotation at any one time that's a that's a good that's a good point dead phoenix just simply remember several billion words that can't be that hard 
<laughs> I can't find my book at the moment, but yeah, I, I mean, and that's the thing, right? Is especially with with the Mwangi book, especially you get a lot of people who are, if anything, culturally invested in whatever cultures you're kind of trying to represent. It's something that I feel adds a lot of personality because, I mean, leave it to someone you know of certain descent. Like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Norwegian. I, I have, we're like sixth generation Norwegian, or something like that. We actually have a, we have family in Norway that we go to go see, nice. and like the old family farm that we go, <laughs> and it's, I'm sure I know just, just just because i've been there a couple of times and whatever and it's not like i studied but just because i have family there i probably know some things that a lot of people just don't know about norway that people don't even uh don't even pay attention to like um in norway back in yolden times one of their favorite things to do during the winter months when they couldn't go out was to paint like uh paint like their clocks or their chests or whatever and that's a big cultural piece because uh like it is so strange i went to a museum and you see like the chests and everything and then went to the the family house and there's one of those chests sitting in the living Just room the... and it's like that's crazy that you know it, that you can have such a connection at that's so close to the vein there and Terralu are the technicolored ones. Okay. And the MBK, the MBK yeah, MBK, that's right. I love the MBK. <laughs> that's Eleanor, okay. Hi, Eleanor. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, and it, it's also interesting to see how those things sort of drift over time and mm -hmm. sort of region. You know, I'm, I'm from, I was born and raised in Hawaii, so like we have we have a lot of things that have drifted quite a lot from uh, wherever they started. Like, you know, we have, like, si Simon. It's always food, right? We have, like, Simon, which is just kind of like, what if, what if ramen, but we didn't have any quite of the right ingredients, and everybody's idea of the, like, noodle soup dish kind of got sort of combined, so it's it is noodles and broth and it's kind of it's kind of like a ramen or a, or a shaman and broth but also like you put fish cake and spam and spinach in it and it's great yeah um, the amount of hawaiian culture around spam is so interesting as well yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah so that's like that's that's the stuff i'm super excited to see in the world guide probably more specifically though the character guide i'm sure is gonna have a lot of very fun uh, little tidbits like that kind of mixed in as well. Uh, and I know there was a particular archetype I think you were very excited for coming on the guide. If I'm not mistaken, it was like the Magical Girl one, or was that... Starless Sentinel, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Starless Sentinel, which is, which is kind of our take on the Magical Girl, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, any Anything in particular that you may have already talked about that you're super excited about for like character options that we can expect to see um i mean that book is still kind of a ways out so i'm not mm -hmm. that's, i'm not gonna drop a ton of spoilers but i think like i think first of all first of all there are six new ancestries in it and mm -hmm. i think that kind of with where we are in the system we can start to play with the ancestry formula a lot more than we have in the past just because we're kind of at this point you know mm -hmm. howl of the wild does this as well um of yeah. course we're like i think each of them is is just very different uh we have something with like yagwai for instance they have a humanoid shape and they have their sort of yagwai form which is a little more like spirity and their humanoid shape tends to give them a bonus in a in skills or something that might be a little more useful outside of combat and their Yagoi form has their kind of more typical ability. But then a lot of their abilities might change a little bit depending on their Yagoi, on what kind of Yagoi they are. So a Yagoi is a spirit that's like awakened from something and it can awaken from an animal or it can awaken from an object or it can awaken from a plant or it can just awaken from, you know, a force of the elements or nature. So 
you know, they have an unarmed strike feat, as many do, but mm -hmm. you know, if you say something where if you are awakened from animal, you might be a wolf, so your unarmed strike feat might be like a claw attack. But if you are awakened from I was a bolt of lightning that awoke to have, you know, spiritual power and sapience, then your unarmed strike is probably like it's like a ranged lightning attack, for instance. So, That's so cool. Yeah. That's dope. Yeah, it's very modular in that sense. I think they're all very different. I mean, I've been talking about Tanuki a lot because just like I, I love Tanuki so much. Mm -hmm. um, that's the that's the one that I that's the thing that I wrote for that book. Um, and so that one I you know I was like reading a lot of like myths uh, kind of here and there, and I just wanted to get the sense of like they're not very good at things. <laughs> they're kind of losers. Um, and I just really wanted to get that ac across in a lot of the abilities. So a lot of the abilities are kind of editorializing on how the Tanuki are not very good at their jobs. Um, in that, and you also have the kind of complete opposite end of the spectrum. Like Yaksha are these very like kind of very regal primal, uh, regal primal spirits, and so they feel very they feel very stately and very cool. They have. Uh, you know, they have ability names like, you know, Sage of Scattered Leaves and that kind of thing that I think are just, they get that very, like, literary vibe across. So I think there'll be a little something for everybody in that. Yeah, I know myself, like, uh, The Simsarans is is mm -hmm. one that I'm immediately, like, I'm I'm so interested to see what they have. They like, okay. I, love, I love the design a lot. I love the concept a lot. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of uh, those stories of like the path to enlightenment and the idea of calling on past lives to like oh. aid in the moment. I think it's just such an interesting concept to, to like play with. I like it a lot. They they get some stuff where you know they they might have like your weapon familiarity feat, but instead you just kind of pick from other humanoid people. You're like you remember this weapon from some point in the past right hmm. um i like i very much like that sort of like contemplative vibe they have going on um i think it's i think it, it fills a very nice role kind of kind of like an elf in that sense um uh that i think is like a nice counterpoint between them and you know like friend guy which are you know the uh water buffalo in minatsa and they have their you know gems and that sort of thing so in addition to that, we also, you know, we have a lot of archetypes and uh, other types of character options coming in there. Uh, we have, we've talked about a Magus hybrid study. Um, yes. and people keep seeing the, the Magus hybrid study, and I'm like, well, you don't know that there's actually two in the book. There's, uh, they are two different ones. They're quite different. Uh, oh. yeah. um, I guess I can drop the names. The first is Aloof Firmament, the other is called Unfurling Brocade. Uh, hmm. I think I'll just leave it at that for now. Okay, um, okay. Unfurling Brocade, that's a that's a very interesting title. Okay, yeah. all right. I, um, I am very curious how that's, how that's gonna shape out. It's fun. Uh, we, got, we got some really good art in that book as well, which I'm excited to start showing off um i kind of forget which they which book which pieces come from sometimes and i have to kind of separate it out whenever i'm doing like a blog or a release or something yeah i know recently i've been mistakenly saying oh yeah we're gonna get some new character options in uh the world guide coming out and i was like wait no that's not right it's that's mostly in character guide uh, mostly yeah the stuff in world guide is the more like is the very I mean, the stuff in the character guide is all very setting tight as well, but the stuff in the world guide is stuff like deities that it kind of straddle that line between, you know, a GM world building and like a like a thing that you base your player around, right? Mm -hmm. Which should be fair, like even in the Mwangi book, uh, one of the gods, Labaiko, one of my favorite gods now. Out of blowing things up. <laughs> yeah, starting fires, blowing things up, and also having the spears, their uh, their weapon mm -hmm. is such a such a cool god. I love the, the aesthetic mm -hmm. behind that. Uh, so, I, actually, I do want to ask one question. So, our current ancestry is kind of tied to the region, like the Kitsune and the Tengu. Going to see some more stuff as well, or is that more just the the broad answer is yes. Um, 
as well as ones that have specific like specific regional expressions that are very different from what they would be in sort of the inner sea baseline i think like a really good example of that is like the dokibi goblin it's like oh, a dokibi okay. is like a is a you know it's sort of the korean version of a goblin um it you know it overlaps in some ways they're mischievous and that kind of thing but their suite of powers is very different um, they're a lot more tied to illusions. They have some specific abilities like wearing a hat. Um, <laughs> My ability uh, wearing hats. I mean the hat the hat does some the hat does some fun stuff. But uh you know, where those are ones where if you wanted like this is a this is a thing that's often thought of as a goblin, but the expression of it is very different in sort of this Asian cultural context. So we wanted to give a heritage that we kind of speaks to those myths a little more um sprites are another good example of that where um some of the manifestations of, of like what a small little nature spirit is are quite different um, mm -hmm. like the kodama well. yeah i we don't there isn't one specifically that's a kodama i think the one that we've revealed so far is the dijang dijang which is um, also known as a hundun, which is the little faceless, it's a little faceless winged furry ball mm. of pure chaos. Uh, like it, it's made oh, from it's... primordial, it's made from primordial chaos, uh, that sort of thing. And, you know, because, because that's the expression there, we also, you know, have some places where you can say, well, like these are very, these are more common in these areas than other things such as like the Corgi Mount Feet, which is a very, um, based very much on English folk tales, might mm -hmm. be uncommon here as well, because it just helps us to be like, yeah, these are the abilities in this part, in these parts of the world and how they might be different depending on where your character is from. So, yeah. Shout out to Corgi Mount, by the way, such an underrated feat. Uh, <laughs> it's really good. It's really, having a familiar that can also be a mount is a surprisingly powerful ability if you use it right. <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't think that having a corgi is a uh, is a powerful ability but it turns out in ttrpgs it can be <laughs> yeah and that's i think that's awesome i i think there's nothing wrong mostly because one it just it's not damage orientated necessarily mm -hmm. but uh it's one of the it's one of those really fun things i think and uh people yeah. people overvalue dps anyways that's fine true, true. oh my god that we're, Never we're conversations. Really oh goodness, but you know you can't you can't take the game out of TTRPG as as much as some people like telling narratives. So there's just people who are gonna focus on that element, you know. I mean, and I designed a I designed a blaster caster, so maybe I'm not the one to be speaking here. But I am also just like sometimes you want to just blow things up, but sometimes you want to trap people in a cage so that everybody else is blowing up attacks. Them much easier you know or what, yeah or whatever whatever debuff have you right i prefer dps as a play style it's i fair. think playing support is boring but also i look at people being like but this this does one less damage on average it is not it is worthless i bet but i bet you appreciate your teammates who uh set you up with uh, who set you up with hastes and and what have you lifesavers it's the thing i look at those healers and i'm like you are the coolest or i look <laughs> at all these support abilities and controller abilities and i'm like this looks awesome for somebody else maybe me on a blue moon if i have a great cool character concept that'll carry it myself i'll maybe come up with something different it's not my play style but if i have a character the narrative comes first i usually come up with the character first build later yeah, i had a a very long time ago, I was making a, a character who was just kind of like a back alley doctor. And I was like, yeah, I can take this, and the party needs more healing, so I'll do this. And my friend who was GMing was just like, did you feel bad taking all the healing abilities? I'm like, I'm playing a back, a back alley doctor. I want to have all the healing. I want to have a lot of healing abilities. And also the ability to sneak attack for large amounts of damage. So, Yeah. yeah. But hey, that's that's sort of, that's the blend, right? That's just you like, both, right? <laughs> you can do both. Uh, my favorite yeah. class is Investigator. I just love classes that are dynamic, can be played in lots of ways, and also have just a way of approaching things from different angles. I love the fact that they can they can plan their attack out ahead of time, and even though it's not as con like action efficient, 
when you get a really good roll on that roll, you're like, I had the perfect idea. I know how I'm going to utterly destroy this person now. I haven't played an investigator, and I very much would like to. But they do... I think the idea... It makes me feel like I am in big brain planning out the attack and then picking the time to use it. Like, it's a cool little... It's a pretty... Like, it's a relatively simple mechanic, but it does make me feel like I am... Uh, I am Guy Ritchie, Sherlock Holmesing. Right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's a, uh, it's the, it's the feel of it that I think is what gets me. But I also like very cerebral classes. I like classes that make me think. Again, stimulation. I need, I need to be having like plans going on to be invested. And the one investigator thing I've delved into, I was really happy to find when they, I found out they have an interrogation and then uh, a lot of methods to properly role play Columbo as an investigator because <laughs> they have so many methods of doing the oh just one the... more thing just one more question my thing for my my reference point for one more thing will always be uncle from Jackie Chan Adventures but so one which led me to thing. which yeah. led me to read that in a very different way uh but then <laughs> I, I was like oh right this this is a Columbo thing this is you know yeah uh and just to address the chat uh the idea of Instead of a corgi mount, you have to write a Shiba Inu, not a corgi. Uh, as someone who has lived in Japan, got a Shiba Inu, uh, has actually has a Shiba Inu from Japan. Uh, if that's going to be a thing, there has to be a mechanical thing of uh, making sure your familiar can actually ignore your uh, orders and just pretend you don't exist. Because uh, I swear to God, I've never met more uh, cat-like or temperamental dogs with selective hearing yeah. in my life love them to death but like shivas are the best but also like they are so self-serving <laughs> uh and, and to the chat specifically we'll get to like a question part more towards the ends you know after we we have a lot of the, the core discussion but to just hit some core points before we actually because we might answer your questions through just the essentially the interview so like last like somewhere in the last 30 minutes 20 minutes uh we'll probably get to that uh, but speaking on more things to talk about, the How of the Wild. So let's shift gears a little bit because How of the Wild, I think, is not necessarily very different, but it's definitely not like based on specific culture and is more based on like, uh, I guess, cultures of specific kinds of ancestries, I guess, is the vibe I get from it. Yeah, it's. It's not as much meant to dive into a sort of real world culture or folkloric mm -hmm. kind of sense. It's meant more to approach a specific character or character type, or like a creature type. Yeah. Um, which in this case is animals and beasts and that kind of thing. And uh, in that sort of way, we wanted, like, there obviously, you know, there, there's no such thing as like a, like a completely culturally void thing obviously but right. like yeah the focus we want to take is a very much just kind of like sense of wonder at the natural world um that's very much the the kind of vibe going into it is like i think especially in earlier editions the idea was that animals are sort of a bore an intentionally boring creature type that you sort of grow out of by level three mm -hmm. and i'm like I'm now going to list things that real life animals that actually exist can do. Um, you know, generate electricity, navigate by screaming at things, avoid being detected by by screaming back at the destructive frequency that you are being screamed at by a bat. Um, punch things so hard you momentary you break the laws of fluid dynamics for a split second. Uh, you know, these are all very cool things. Um, and, you know, I was, I, like, I, I was a biology major, and, like, I, you know, I grew up, I think the, I think there's a shot of me in the ocean with my dad when I was, like, three weeks old. Um, you know, I grew up snorkeling and spearfishing, and then I was a bio, and then I majored in biology and volunteered at, you know, marine research labs when I went home for the summer and that sort of thing. So, like, I think that's really cool, and I I wanted to sort of like, hey, animals and beasts are very cool, and then you know you of course you have a fantasy world where you can put magic and you know 
and to see areas like what if it ingested star metals onto it, right? Yeah. The idea, like, the, there can still be animals, but what if these animals lived in a fantasy world and adapted to a location that had magic and worse, horrible things to deal with in their environment? Mm -hmm. So, you know, evolutionarily, they have maybe even other things to deal with. Because, yeah, that's that's actually a very good point. Uh, mo like, animals are usually treated like, you know, you're really young, uh, early in your adventures, like, oh, th that's a bear! Oh, no! <laughs> What level? Bear. What level do you think a hippo or a moose is? Like, because they're definitely not level one creatures, right? No, definitely not. Like, hippos are terrifying. A hundred percent. They gotta be like, a, a, like a second or third level at oh, least. If I'd put them at like a five to a seven. You That's know? fair. <laughs> a moose maybe, maybe a third level threat. I'd put yeah. those. They're they're vicious and like yeah the. There are animals just in our world that are capable of terrifying feats. Like, what? There's the lizard that can shoot like it's blood, blood out of its eye. Like, yeah, it's <laughs> terrifying. And yeah, then, like, like the idea it, of just scaling it up. It shoots blood out of its eyes as, as a deterrence tactic, and I was like, I would be deterred by that. You are correct. I'd back away. I, I'd I'd go in the other direction. I, um... and there's just so many cool options that are already just kind of being hinted at in that aspect that I think it's a uh, it's a cool way of handling that. There there are some allusions to like more real world cultures in them where it's appropriate. Like the Minotaur, the Bull of Minos has, you know, a very it has like a very look into Iblidos and that sort of Greek inspired stuff in there. Something like the Merfolk has a very intentional like split of abilities that are associated with with kind of mermaid legends in various parts of the world. So they have both, for instance, the more classical, you know, the kind of siren -y mermaid abilities where they sing with their song. But they also have, um, you know, some abilities that are a little more Asian, like, uh, you know, crying pearls or um, one where they're, you know, there's some myths where they're, the flesh of a mermaid can like confer immortality or something. So they like have an ability where they have like a healing blood ability. And then they also have like some just some good old fashioned sea witch type stuff. So it's, it's like a very much a mix because it's not so much focused on one part of the world. It's not really a Lost Omens book. Um, it's a little broader. And so we kind of want to take them and all mix and match them together. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's I think a lot of people are very excited for How the Wild because it's it's just a book for creating weird little guys is I think the biggest thing people <laughs> there are, are a lot of weird little about. guys in that book yeah. yeah I I really like also we have these um sort of like sort of like uh Darwin inspired illustrations that look like the sort of anatomical drawings or scientific drawings you would see in like that era we've made we've made a couple of them uh public so far and I think it's just I'm always I'm a sucker for like here is the like anatomical breakdown of like Manticore's tail and how its spikes are like oh. regrowing and attaching and that sort of thing. I so. it, if if it was such a thing, I'd be a crypto biologist. <laughs> that that would be my job. If I lived in a fantasy world, crypto biology would probably be my like core. That's thing. just bi that's just biology in the fantasy world. Yeah. Well, I don't know, because if it, it if it's like a magical creature and kind of extends outside of the natural realm or what you'd expect to be the natural realm, you know, no, I, I, mean, I mean, I guess, I, guess I don't know. We don't have a good etymology for it because we just don't live in the world. It extends to like, uh, if it's just out and about in your day to day life, you got to deal with like griffins coming down and stealing your cows. Are you going to argue like that's not natural, though? Oh, that's a thing in uh, that's a thing back in Tian Sha or the, the Velash Raj has three seasons. It has season monsoon season and dinosaur season universally agreed upon to be the worst of the three seasons <laughs> I, I'd, I'd agree i think uh, basically after after i think it's after the rainy season all of the dinosaur eggs hatch and now you just it's like any other time you have a large amount of pests hatching at once except the pests are dinosaurs yeah, i true. do i do like to imagine because when i hear that that does imply that there's like one or two couple assholes that are like nah monsoon season though <laughs> monsoon season's worse though and like no the dinosaurs they ate everything <laughs> no mm -mm. Yeah. my house blew away way worse than dinosaurs i was inconvenienced by the monsoon dude <laughs> my family was eaten by a t-rex what are you talking about 
there's an art of that somewhere in the book where there's just too many dinosaurs. As yeah. as in Howl, actually. Howl also has a fair number of dinosaurs in it. Hell yeah. Ooh. Yeah, oh, I'm so excited about the druid. Uh, I guess it's going to be a, a class archetype or something that's going to allow them to be more shapeshifter, werewolfy transformation. That's what it says on the. Uh, are you talking about the wild mimic or? I don't know. I so I'm very, I, I'm very bad about keeping up to date on the Paizo live streams because I'm always like super busy or something. So, but on the web page itself, it mentions like a something with druids and like more transformation based abilities. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, we've. We have added some stuff there to to the druid and to oh, I'm still here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. We have added some stuff to like the druid and the animal instinct uh, barbarian that just kind of gives them a few more a few more options and that sort of thing. Uh, but they're cool animal abilities. Yeah, and then playable wear creatures is something that I'm gonna have to mess around with. That's going to be really interesting. And then there's the one there. There's the one that popped off in our discord when it was announced. The, uh, the swarm keepers. The swarm one, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Everyone immediately Bees. was like, yes, I want to, I want to tend to the high. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that one. I think it'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Next, next month's going to be probably one of my favorite months of the year because one, I've been, because I, I have an archetype series where I'm looking at all the archetypes to kind of talk about them and all that kind of stuff. And I have put it on a hiatus because I'm kind of waiting for some remaster stuff to kind of filter out some of the, the facts and stuff. Just because I just don't want to redo videos more than anything. I did I did yeah. Hell Knights recently and I'm like, ah, I'm going to have to redo Hell Knights, aren't I? Because uh, they have so many alignment based features and abilities. And this book will be one of the first books I'll get the ability to go back to my my archetype series, which is something I was very proud of early on. I have like almost a hundred videos of the archetypes already. Wow, man. Uh, I I do love the archetypes so much as a concept, and so it's like one of the quick things I look at whenever a new book drops is like because they're just so fun, and we all operate with the free archetype uh, rule, so yeah. like it's. It's something that can, like, we, like, looking through, you see an archetype idea, and you're like, that's a character idea. Let me build around that in a fun way. I think the archetypes give a good... They tend to be a lot more focused than um, the classes. The classes tend to intentionally have multiple ways you can play or build the class, right? That's, mm. that's intentional. Mm. And sometimes it's because there are specific class paths, and sometimes just because they have a very free-flowing structure. Um, but like, you wouldn't do something like, you know, like the Time Mage as a full class necessarily, but it is the kind of thing that like, is really cool for an archetype because it's going to be really focused and then you can get really time specific abilities. I, I think that, I think that like that, that level of specificity is often where people kind of want to set their character designs now, you know? Yeah. You know, people are like, I think it's one of the reasons Kineticist is very popular, because you can just be like, I want to be all about fire or something, or all about, you know, using wind attacks or something. Yeah, I feel like, especially when you're using free archetype, because and for our own house rule, we, we for free archetype, we only do non-multi-class archetypes in it, uh, mm -hmm. because I feel like they can be more character-defining than e the I'm core classes. Too. Yeah. It's yeah. something that adds extra detail to your character, or especially for some of the later ones, and like you can work with your GM to talk to. It can be like a nice mid-game character goal, like to work towards, mm -hmm. you know, like literally like Time Mage, because it's a higher up yeah. thing to work towards. Uh, it's like level six or something. Uh, so the idea of a wizard that is working at those lower levels to unlock the secrets of Chronomancy like yeah. a fun little story to tell i i like I like in general the idea of you know if you're gonna be working towards a specific if you if you're kind of looking forward to a specific level where you get a cool thing i like the idea of bringing that into story it's like not just i'm studying so much but like 
I need to go steal the professor's spell book so I can read it, so I can be like, oh, that's how the theorem works, and now I understand it all, now I'm going to go off and study it myself, or something like that, right? He's speaking right at you, Alex. Yeah. I'm, this my, is my exactly wizard, his uh, current character. Oh, okay, my, my then. wizard is a guy who, um, he, he couldn't afford wizard college, so he got a job in the stacks, did homework for rich kids so he could, like, learn <laughs> their homework, and uh, also... Uh, in the library, he would steal books, copy them, make bootleg spell books to sell. Uh, the idea of bootleg spell books. And then uh, he got cursed by an abolith because he went. He finally learned how to pick locks, got in the restricted section, opened the wrong book, and an abolith was very upset. I think, was it the magicians that was like, can't trust Google magic. Like, yeah. you never get any good spells on Google. That's that's what he was. He was selling uh he was selling spell books and a lot of them were like just people were like, Oh yeah, no, I'm a wizard, right? If I have this book I'm a wizard, like, yeah, definitely. That's all it is. And yeah. uh so I, what's in the book. He, he travels the world and with the party he, he uses disguise magic, he goes into nice libraries and he's like looking for information on the plane of water to break his curse. And uh he's just looking at books. He's like, Oh, that's about the plane of water. Like half this book is or this one page, rip, and then he just takes it and then leaves. Unfortunately, that spell was in a completely different framework than the other spell, so if I try to cast them together, something's going to blow up. <laughs> uh. Yeah, it's, it's, and see, that's the thing, right? So that's where you get the fun of archetypes, because uh, his curse was represented by Curse Maelstrom, essentially. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. So... So uh, right around when Curse Maelstrom dropped, too, is where I picked it. It was, like, fresh. <laughs> and I was like, well, I gotta. Because this is the coolest thing ever. I like the art for that archetype, because it's just a Tengu, which we're supposed to be good at not getting cursed. And, like, a broken mirror, and he just has this, like, oh, no. Yeah. Sort of face. And, like, there's definitely some, like, bad stuff happening. <sighs> the, I do the like the art, art a lot. Is so good. The art's so good, and, like, Curse Maelstrom is so fun. I, I love... Like, there's a lot of archetypes that are exactly like that. They're just the kind of thing where you look at it and you're like, okay, this immediately changes how I can tell the story. I can put my background around this. I can work towards the story. It's it's so many little extra bits you can add in and, like, define your character out or build out to a larger narrative, which is, like, great to see. It also just mechanically building it out because you also have a on-paper thing that is showing like your story which is super cool yeah it, i think it also adds this level of like mixing and matching and that's the point at which number of character options becomes more than what we can explicitly give you mm -hmm. like if we make 12 classes even if we make 50 classes we kind of we know that people are going to pick from within those 12 or even 50 options but then like you know, once once it becomes like with the whole ancestry combining with this many ancestries times this many classes times this many types of class times this many archetypes, it becomes like a we just can't predict it, right? I yeah. think the version of this I saw I said this on the last Howl stream, and I can't remember whether I saw this in like a Discord or on Twitter or whatever, but somebody's like, I wanna play an awakened animal that is a bee is also a swarm keeper. So I am just the queen bee. And then I'm directing all of the other bees to go do my bidding and stuff. And I was like, I did not see that one coming. I like that I live in a world where that idea is a thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It, and it works so well. And that's exactly what I've been thinking of this whole time is How the Wild is the perfect book for players who want to make weird little guys. Just like it has all the things that players want. Literally, it's large ancestries because players want large ancestries players just want to be big i don't know why but players just want to be big even though it's inconvenient sometimes narratively uh there's also minotaurs would, minotaurs would build 10 foot 10 foot wide corridors it's just how that works you know I, right i think playing a large ancestry part of the fun is now you have to role play out now regular houses don't feed, don't don't work anymore. Like you have to like, you have to justify that narratively in some spots, which is like, I mean, that's the fun of it. I, it's something that I also have enjoyed because we played Daggerheart recently and I played a giant, and so 
we were we were crawling through like a, a, a hidden bandits root system under these big trees my character is struggling so much and it's fun i i don't get me wrong it's just it's just the number one thing where it's just like there's a game and players say like okay how do i get big i don't know how it's just always a thing but now it's like also now players can play a bear because players also want to play bears yes <laughs> and uh, you can uh, play a fish a fish yeah players can play any weird little guy any kind of interesting idea and now i have now i've been made aware of the uh the 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 century my character is, is actually a beehive i'm technically like the queen inside but i'm actually just a, a, like a, a working hive that just moves that, uh, around. That reminds that's me of the i can't remember what the name is but it's the starfinder ancestry that's like a tiny sized squid but then it has a hydrokinetic water body around it don't remember what the name of that one is, but I really like it. Yeah, well, yeah, Starfinder in general has so many very, very fun uh, ancestries, and I can't wait for Starfinder 2, because I'm sure there's going to yeah. be a lot more really fun ones. The reason I'm excited, too, because, like, I'm a, I'm a sci-fi guy at heart, mm. like, over fantasy. Uh, I mean, on my own, like, channel that I cover, uh, my main game is uh, Warhammer 40k. So, like, okay. I... I'm a big, I'm a big sci-fi nerd. Is that not a fantasy? There is fantasy, which is also the <laughs> bit where I'm seeing Paizo, like, like Warhammer fantasy is cool, but then also I look at some of their lore and I'm like, man, this is such a surface level examination of like, because it's a whole like a weird. I don't know it super well other than the, the things that have percolated out, like, you know, red makes ship go faster. Yeah, uh, it, that's about. <laughs> Which I actually, I actually really enjoy as a thing. I enjoy that as the idea of like power of collective belief just making it a thing. Uh, oh yeah, is, it's is a trope that is a trope that you can approach in a lot of different ways, and I, I just in general like it. Yeah, the orcs are the one you you teach somebody like yeah. if you want to get into Warhammer 40k. It's like, oh yeah, these guys, uh, they're not orcs; they're actually fungus. Uh, and then also just go into like all the fun stuff. But yeah, they're uh, like Warhammer Fantasy is like a weird reflection of our Earth. Like the world map is basically oh. Earth, but just a little different. But a lot of like the regions are trying their best to like share a lot of cultural spots. But then when you dig into it, it's like a, well, this one's the Middle East region. What do they have? Yeah, it's just like turbans, flying carpets, genies. Anything else? No, that's kind of it. Okay, cool. And then it's like, then it's cool actually going into a setting for me as a giant history and myth, uh, like mythology buff. That's like my my entire jam. Going into Pathfinder, being like, finally fantasy embracing a lot of other like cultural influences and history. I love this. I, I love. Think, God. I think I, I said this somewhere recently. I can't remember, but it's very much the there's cool myths from all over the world like i i just really like that you know that's i we just did the play test for the war of immortals class and i did the exemplar class which is very much just the what if global mythology is the class it's so good. Um, i'm excited to see which, more. I had a, which i had a lot of fun doing although it also resulted in my roommate knowing what the introduction theme to the indian television 1988 mahabharata stories introduction sounded like um because i did watch a fair bit of it at the recommendation of our cultural consultants uh but it, no it, it's cool and once you have this sort of once you have like multiple kind of versions of any one given cultural area you kind of free it from a lot of the well it has to now represent everything and now it can just be like yeah there is you know, there is the, I'm just going to go back to Tianzhou because it's, it's easy, you know, it's like there is the martial arts nation. There is also the philosophy nation. There is also the haunted clockworks area. There is also the, like, everybody is scheming all the time area. There's also the we're fighting demons area. There's actually a couple of those, you know, but then, like, one doesn't really have to kind of become everything to the whole area. You can just kind of spread it out and then it lets... It lets places kind of wear more hats and have more distinct fantasy themes that you can kind of come back to, and that's always yeah. that's always great. You can it kind of lets you relax a little bit, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, like, as much as people call it like, uh, oh goodness, what's it called? It's a uh, theme park style settings, 
Mm-hmm. Sorry, one second. Our dryer's <laughs> going off. <laughs> Anyway, more theme park kind of settings. You kind of have to parse information out in a very kind of like uh, digestible ways so that it makes it easier to engage with because otherwise you get a you get a setting that's like here you are, anything can happen and then the GM is like oh no. I, it's like I had this problem with Lancer because Lancers are a very, very cool setting. And there are some sections of the Lancer setting that are very more parsed out into like a specific thing. But the the majority of the setting is very uh, ambiguous with all the themes they have because it's just so expansive. You're, you're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of worlds and millions and billions of people. You know, you're just gonna have a little bit of everything everywhere. But that makes it so hard to engage directly with. So having something that's parsed out, like I like, uh, I like the Eye of Dread because each of like sections of the Eye of Dread in Lost Omens is there's something there that you can like engage with directly. I think, I think to the, I have like either a kitchen sink setting or like the sort of the Planet of Hats trope. I think that like having this sort of core thing of the region be clear is not necessarily the same thing as the region kind of beginning and ending at that one point right mm-hmm. like right yeah like just to to go back to something like queen queen is the martial arts wuxia nation so what is its intro trope its intro trope is this is where people fight all the time and it also has things like where what is the political system look like in an area that is you know, just is just populated by people who can like quite casually punch mountains apart. Yeah. Um, you know, and that and that's really very interesting. And like what's it like for the like layperson living there? And so you know, you can try I mean like the the core hook should be easy to grasp, right? Mm-hmm. But then mm-hmm. once you've gotten there you can also be like, okay now like, I often joke that like as Pathfinder is a kitchen sink setting, you know, it, yeah. and it is meant to be a very kind of broad appeal setting. I'm always like, we should do we should do the basic thing. Then we should also try to go innovate like two steps farther than that. So like I know uh Luis and Kent worked really hard on like the new dragons. And it's like like we are doing the recognizable thing. We have dragons, right? Dragons are the most recognizable fantasy monster. Then also it's like, and do we have a dragon that breathes fire? Yes. Um, but also it's Hellfire. And also we have another dragon that can make I hate this dragon so much. Can make a flesh suit. Ah, uh, conspirator uses. dragon. I've I've been I've been very clear with Luis that I greatly dislike this dragon, even though I understand that I'm not supposed to like it. Um it's you know. my favorite. Uh, I, and then I we have it. Yeah. You know, and then we also have the the dragon like uh my favorite, the Adamantine dragon, which I think I am certain has to fly by some sort of magnetic repulsion because it is so chunky. Um yeah, true. It like is, those are all, yeah. but those are all, yeah, but those are all the dragons. But also, I know Luis and Kent were like getting really into the like, well, what would it look like if we took this theme and how would it look like in this way and how can we make it still feel like a dragon but like a really unique take on one? Like, what if the dragon could make illusions or could kind of see the future and timeline split, you know? Yeah, it's, it's really the cool. difference of like where the planet of the hats trope kind of is that trope is you like literally how that it originated land on the planet hello we're all wearing blue hats that's our thing there's nothing deeper if there's like a core trait that's easy to like understand right at the gate but then you're also taking that trait and using it as a point to okay now let's understand how does this dictate like their economy politics living situation how everything is like set up as a society like you're taking things to its like absolute extreme how it would function in a world that that that's where it ceases to be like that that's not a hat you're wearing it's a whole ass outfit yeah yeah uh i mean i think any good setting or any good ttrpg in general needs layers it needs something that can be engaged at the level that the reader, player, GM, whatever, wishes to engage at because then they can expand on whatever layer they end up on as much as they like. And that that's, I think, where accessibility comes into a large part of it. 
I think yeah it I think it just helps to like you know people say like don't judge a book by its cover but I'm like is the, what's sort of the point of the cover is to yeah, give right. you a sense of is to give you a sense of what what is in the book you know if I went to the book and it has you know it's all I mean, it has like a very simplified crayon drawings and it's a thin book and the font is really big and blocky I'm like oh maybe this is the kind of thing that would be good for my like five-year-old nieces right or if it has you know like if it's all like uh you know if it has like the gothic font and it's in monochrome I'm like maybe this is a horror book <laughs> you know that sort of thing um, yeah so yeah the 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 you want to you want you want to you want to signal what it's about and set the expectations right but you also want to like try try and it's it's always hard to balance but like try to leave room for people to be surprised by it right mhm mm yeah and i mean i think that's something that Paizo has just done very well is it's a game that i feel like you can engage at, at multiple levels of like skill as a, as a role player as much as like a, a tabletop player cuz like you want someone who's new to the game to like have a good time is like put them put them as a fighter they're gonna be good kind of no matter what they do it's really hard to mess up a fighter build in the first place uh because worst case scenario they're as good as everyone else when it comes to fighting they do that or i would say do start as a bard is what i always say bard's another really you, good one i think what you do is very simple it's like do one thing sing a song you know yeah though i really like the bard class and i think if you if you really dig in the bard you can come out with a very fun character and i mean that's a lot of the kick kick classes to be fair like kineticist has so much modularity that it can be literally anything you want it to be by the end of the game yeah yeah that's i mean that's a very i also had the point where once we were we knew we were doing if you do kineticist you have to do a certain number of elements and you know there were going to be six elements so that was at least going to be like we knew that was going to be one really long class uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and I mean, there's also classes that I think are at deeper levels as well. Like Swashbuckler can be a little bit hard to get the right feel for, but when you do, it works really well. Uh, Alchemist is a class I, I really, really enjoy, but it's a it's a class that most of its class options are not in its class section, but in the item section of yeah. the book. Not unlike a spellcaster in that way. Yeah. yeah. There's kind of the the difference between classes that are more of a mechanical thing and classes that are kind of just like a vibe. Yeah. And I think like what is Swashbuckler? The Swashbuckler is a very like vibe driven class. The same way like Investigator, I think. Mm hmm. But that's a good thing. Is like you have levels of engagement where things are easy and they're very like surface level, but there's also things that seem very surface level that you dig into and can really get more out of. Uh, and with a lot of these character options coming out in How the Wild and a lot of the character options I'm very excited for in Tian Sha, it sounds like there's a lot of very fun, interesting, like thought provoking ideas that are already coming to mind. I think, I mean, Paizo players have been, are eating really well this year. We got so much and there's more. Uh, especially because next week, and I'll, I'll announce this again later, but next week we're not going to have Riptide because you guys are hosting a big uh, stream right when we normally have Riptide. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> so um, uh, it's where they talk about which god is dying. Yes. Ooh, I, yeah. uh, that's been, I think we just had the last one of those this week. So yeah, um, I, would, I would tune into that stream. It should be fun. I don't know a lot of what, is going on in that other than the broad strokes but i think it'll be a fun one i am so curious to see if my second guess is right because my guess and my conspiracy of why uh my unfounded conspiracy completely made up uh <laughs> was wrong and that's <laughs> messed up it's messed up that it happened uh literally right after we had michael sayer on and i explained like you know how cool it would be if I was correct, and it feels a little targeted. Not gonna lie. Uh, <laughs> Somebody saying like, I wonder if they're just changing it in real time. I was like, it takes a really long time to publish books. This was all decided a long yeah. time ago. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. Logically, everything's been planned out. I can still lash out that my, <laughs> my double and triple <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, 
It was, uh, I got tagged multiple times of how vocal I am of, like, <laughs> I'm gonna be correct. I, I'm, I, 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 I binked this. And then I got tagged multiple times in our Discord being like, oop, you were wrong. And I was like, no, no, it's fake. Oh, as well, as, as well, as well one should be, yes. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, I am, I'm curious, though, at least before we open up to other questions, uh, to one bit with, uh, to how the Wild. Um, it was also something you mentioned earlier in the stream talking about just you know everyone gets their one their one thing that they kind of Ooh, yeah. get to work on and like their their uh their passion idea for at least like how the wild is there anything that's in this book especially because it's the one that's going to come out uh most immediately mm -hmm. is there anything that's in this book that you're like especially proud of like your work or your contribution to as big or as simple as you will. Um, I did not do any primary writing on the book because I, I typically, because a, a monster book is typically a good place to sort of get a wide number of authors on it as opposed to something like with a class in it where you know that a lot of like a book, a lot of the Gen Con books that have classes in them, for instance, you know, the classes are always written in house and they tend to push a lot of other stuff. I think. There's a couple of weird things in this book that are that are kind of that were just some of the some of the creatures in this book were either things that were pre-existing that we knew we wanted to update or were things that we knew we were going to do and some were just described with kind of like a a vibe it was just like one of them was I think it was like precious material creature thing here was like you need to be able to get a precious material from the creature but if you like don't handle the combat with it correctly it will destroy the precious material um this turned into something called the stony goat which basically is a goat that uh flexibly petrifies itself in response to threats so if you want to like and it's it's cud is worth a fair amount of like money because it's has like precious metals in it or something but of course if you like if it self petrifies, it starts to like, and then it takes damage. It just drains it from the amount of gold you would start to get from it, theoretically. So like, there's stuff like that where like it was just kind of a prompt given to the author, and the author could kind of do whatever they wanted with it as long as it kind of still hit the prompt. Um, that's there. Uh, mm -hmm. one or two of the archetypes is one or two of the archetypes are there because I kind of just thought it'd be fun. There is an archetype that uses embedded magical symbiote um Ooh. fun uh i think the overall narrative of the book is something i've kind of been very happy with and i think especially the way we rolled it out we had the we did this like um one a day time story sort of fiction last may i think when we announced the book that was called like grandmother stories because the sort of meta conceit of the book is that Baron Thet, when he was, he, who's the narrator of the book, he's like in a Rixie, is searching for these four creatures called the Wardens of the Wild, which are these like large mythical animals that he knows from a bedtime story that his grandmother told him. So the, and now he's, you know, now he's old and he's looking for them, but the sort of prologue, as it were, that we did in web fiction was, you know, him being told these stories when he's like a child. Uh, and I thought that, and it was fun to just see people sort of speculate and wait for, you know, story time with grandmother. Uh, oh, so that's funny. Yeah. That was good fun, yeah. Um, I'll know that, like, the prologue of any life's, of any life's journey type of adventuring movie has to be when they're, like, a child and they were like, oh, Atlantis is over here, or, like, oh, the Lost Flying Castle is over here, or, like, mm -hmm. Dragon yeah, Island is over here, you know, and I have to go find it someday. So that's kind of the the homage to that. Sort of and style I can of story. Picture like the movie beginning of the like let me tell you a story, like the storybook opening. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's... Prologue. I know uh I know you had Michael on and I know he's very big on things being cinematic, and I think that that's that's true when you are, you know, throwing your axe and the axe splits, you know, a line of earth and then explodes in a shower of lightning or whatever. Uh that's mm -hmm. important, but I also like I also like this sense of like trying to be cinematic in like kind of smaller, smaller or more like cozier, intimate moments as well. I think it. Yeah, it's free run, free run. 
Lot exactly, it can bring in like a nice vibe to it. Uh, yeah, that's that's, it. that's the reason I'm excited to actually watch it because I, I, when I was looking at the reviews and I saw clips, I'm like, oh, this looks delightfully quiet and somber. Yeah. It's nice. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it's a little. I crazy mean, too. I mean, Evan, Evan called it the music. So when the fight scenes come on, the the flute is going really hard. But uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, more like it looks like a show that knows when to uh, yeah. s like pull back a little. Good yeah, and I think I think even if you have like some of our some of our projects or you know, some f works of fiction even are just more broadly are just kind of high octane all the time. And I think even if they're high octane all the time, you always have to like let off the gas a little bit at some points. Otherwise, like it's like if you're listening to like any sort of like really really banger of a song, and if it's like you know why do you go down in the verses or in the bridge? It's like it's so you can come back up for the chorus. You know yeah. you need that that contrast. Otherwise, it, you start to just kind of get inured to it. Right? It's the the bit with writing too when you're writing for genre. Um, it, it's something I encountered with screenwriting. It's like if you're writing a comedy, one thing you need to keep in mind is the idea of adding some element of tragedy or drama to it because you need something else to offshoot the comedy. So when it gets funny again, it hits harder. Or yeah, it's if like you have. When, when do horror. people breathe? Right. Yeah. Or like if you have horror, you also need to have elements where someone can be like genuinely happy and like uplifted. So then when the next scare happens, they're thrown off guard even harder. It's, it's like that same feeling when it comes to even like action-packed stuff mm -hmm. um yeah uh now's a good point uh if anyone in the audience has any questions for james go ahead and feel free to ask i will say if you're asking for super spoiler things don't be surprised when he goes like can't talk about it and there goes your question so you know uh keep mm -hmm. it keep it light on spoilery things uh there was one good question that i'm also curious about though i'm sure if it is a thing you can't really talk about anyway but i'm gonna ask it regardless uh arcadia when that's i don't know that's uh that's not the book that i'm on right now that's fair that's not, you know i know that's a thing that luis and some other people on staff have been very passionate about you know i'm not sure if or when we'll do that but uh, that is not anything on the docket for right now, right? That's fair. Okay, uh, yeah. that was just the first question that jumped out to me personally. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a that's that's a you got to get Luis on to pester him for that. So you know, I I think I will. I think Luis will be the next person I talk to. I think <laughs> because mostly because now we had the perfect primer of the War of the Immortal stuff. Essentially, is getting like some of it's getting a little bit revealed plus the book is going to be announced i think in the next stream uh so then luis will hopefully be able to talk more about what's coming up in in the future so uh any plans on redoing old advent or avs for 2e to make them more orc compliance uh, like the adventures, APs. Oh, I was, yeah, they got corrected. Adventure paths, yeah. So yeah, I mean something. that's, I mean that's the that's the purview of the narrative team. You know, I do know that they work. They, they tend to work quite a ways ahead. You know, they have a lot of adventures planned right now. I don't know whether they intend to. Uh, it's possible. Uh, I'm just I'm not quite sure what they have planned on that. So. Uh, yeah, I, I guess on our uh, on our primer for the, the audience as well. Let's try to keep things more like along the lines of like Chan <laughs> Shaw, how how the Wild, or anything about James personally, because uh, it's a big company, a lot's going on, and no individual yeah, person. I feel especially and especially as you know, the company has grown quite a lot as you know we've stepped up production as just the. As the process of making books has gotten a lot more just complex you know as the books have gotten a lot richer um and so where there used to be really small teams where we kind of always knew it's like we have a number of departments and in some ways it's really cool because i um you know uh jenny jerzabski uh i was talking about how hit me up and she was just like oh that sounds really cool and then i had been watching a separate stream about uh one of the playtest classes for starfinder and i was like 
I had not seen this. This is really cool. Uh, it's cool that like it's like the first time she was talking about Mechageddon. I was like, how have I not heard about Mechageddon yet? This sounds great. Um, mm -hmm. Also, yeah, I'm super stoked for that as well. Yeah. Uh, especially as a Lancer player now. Uh, mechs bring more. Uh, yeah. Curious. I know we're a fair ways away from the Tian Shot character guide, but can we confirm whether there's a similar archetype character option, yada yada, to emulate either one E's ninja or samurai? Obviously not bold classes, but something that might lead towards that. Um, the kind of and you'll see this when you read the the world guide and like kind of what is emphasized where the kind of impression that we had was that like these were not you kind of have the options you need to play those classes and there's a couple of more things we have you know like there are specific items or maybe a specific ability but there it's not really a thing we wanted to spend as many pages on because it was kind of already very supported like there were other things like say the Starless Sentinel medical girl, that's not a thing you can do in the existing rules in really any capacity mm -hmm. where we wanted to kind of spend that detail. So, yeah. Yeah, like, if you want to play a samurai, you can play a fighter and have options yeah. like that. Yeah, there's there's also the thing where I think the, the concept of a samurai is kind of torn in the popular culture between kind of three very different Mm -hmm. play styles all of which are very different from kind of what they are or were sort of more classically so it's probably something that's better approached via taking what you want to do and you know if you want to be more of like that like leader type of thing you know something like cavalier or, um those Marshall. kind of those kind of archetypes or yeah versus if you just want to have a sword or a pole arm alternatively right so sword pole arm or a, gun a big big bow <laughs> or gun. yeah i've been watching shogun and i was like yeah people did people, like they use guns as much i was like yeah very much so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, a large part of it was guns actually remember, it's a part to remember of uh, a lot of that samurai period so a good chunk of that took place around the same time as like american western period it's like there's yeah there's that there's over. that yeah there's that uh that Tumblr meme floating around that's just like technically in Mexico City you could have had like this samurai, this like uh, this cowboy and this like kind of uh, some something kind of renaissance -y, not quite that but you know Jason mm -hmm. and this pirate all kind of be here and they're all within about a 50 year span of each other yeah. chronologically. Uh, let's see here. Um okay this is a very particular question and i don't know if there's gonna be anything but i'll ask regardless uh were there any funny typos or things that came out that should just be a stat block that came from tiansha any like i i, I guess the question is like it's any gazebos in your that happened during the production of tiansha i'm not sure of the question it it like uh like the the classic example is like the gazebo where someone's trying to describe a gazebo a gazebo to someone and the person thinks it's a monster because they don't understand what a gazebo is and uh, yes. so uh any kind of I think i know stance like that yeah i think a good example of this is the term cultivation okay. uh we're like a, we're like a cultivator is like a specific thing in like a chinese fantasy sense where mm. like um, which basically refers to like cultivating immortality, um, which usually means like you have, you are long lived, you're like a master of various kinds of martial arts and spiritual powers and that kind of thing. But I think a lot of us working on the book were kind of at least passingly familiar with the concept of like a Shensha novel or like cultivation myths or that kind of thing. But I remember trying to explain, it's like, yeah, the cultivator archetype. And somebody was like, is it like a, is it like agricultural? And I was like, no, it's, you know, they, they fly around and they, like, you know, they have swords and cast rituals and that kind of thing. And they're like, but why is it a cultivator? I was like, oh, I see what's happening. You know, so uh, that was, I think, one and just like, and that's the term that has been, you know, kind of used in the, in the English language kind of translation of it for long enough. It's kind of taken on its own 
mm -hmm. thing. Right? Um, but that was the one where there was like kind of like a, a gap there as well. And I think I think now everybody is and every we've been all working on the book for long enough. We're all kind of used to it. But it's uh, certainly a thing where to remember to be like, oh, right, that's that's what this is. We have to kind of ground the concept a little more. Um, you know, when the word is is one that you don't know or understand, whether that's just like a word in English that you don't know or whether it's a word in another language, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, I don't know what that is. What is it? But when it's a word that you definitely do know, like cultivate is a word that, you know, most native English speakers will know what that means. You're just like, oh, now you have that understanding gap. All right, looking for other questions here. Oh, there we go. I was zoomed up in the wrong area. Uh, let's see. Has there been uh, anything to address the difficulties of large creatures to squeeze during a fight, especially if they don't have the skill feat? Like, I'm assuming going through, like, a doorway that they shouldn't normally fit through or something like yeah. that. I think, first of all, this is, this is not thing you should worry about if you're just adventuring or walking around you know it's like we basically said if you are if you're in the market you can have time to duck under the things you know i certainly uh i also lived in japan for quite some time and i definitely hit my head on everything for the first three months and then i didn't hit my head on things anymore i just kind of got into it i can imagine i lucked out that i was a child and mm -hmm. short so like i was I was coasting, but yeah, some of those yeah. doorways are small. Yeah, I was in kind of a rural area for my first uh, about year I was there, but um, do it. <laughs> yeah, but um, the answer is no with an asterisk. Uh, basically, all of the creatures that are large in Howl do have ways. I think there are four creatures that can be large in Howl, and for them, if you want to be large, that is, for some of them, the, the default, you know, for Centaur and Minotaur. For others, like Athamaru or Awakened Animal, that's a thing you opt into. Um, but you can be medium if you want to, but also these are, these are uncommon or rare ancestries. You know, like, if this is a thing you want to do, the kind of assumption is that on a certain level, you know, if the GM is going to put you in a bunch of five five foot quarters or like two foot crawlways maybe that is not the best fit between things or maybe you should look at you know other ways in which your being large could be a boon in those things you know we know that like there are tools there to get to kind of get around it if you still want the flavor obviously like you know if you want to be a medium-sized minotaur you can do that while still having all of the cool stone working and you know in some cases, fate manipulating abilities you otherwise would have. Um, but otherwise, kind of part and parcel of the... I want to play a, an ancestor that sort of stretches the assumptions is that, you know, not every adventure will work as well. I mean, the, the kind of merfolk are a really classic example of that, where, like, mm. they're, they're merfolk, you know. Uh, if you want to not play an aquatic campaign you know we do we do include some gm guidance but it's not you know it's on the level of you know the um the merfolk navigator in the book she has her i think it's formally called a supermarine chair but she calls it her little c which is this uh, essentially mobility device mm -hmm. she has um you know the merfolk does have an have a feat called shore gift where they can come on land it is kind of limited, but so we say, but if you want to play a merfolk and you have a more terrestrial campaign, maybe the GM just gives you shore gift as a bonus feat at level one, but maybe they might do something like say, um, but the shore gift doesn't work on the night of the full moon or of the new moon, or, you know, it doesn't work in this situation to give that sort of narrative tie there. But like, so these are in some ways assumption breaking ancestries. And so that's probably a conversation you should have with your GM about. If you're going to be the merfolk in the desert, that's that is a choice. You can do that. Uh, yeah, but players are free to make it. choices. They don't have to be good choices, though. Yeah, and that, I mean that could be a really cool story. You know, it could be like, you know, this is just like a survival. This is just a survival adventure, and you just have to get to the ocean, right? True. Eleanor says you wanted to be large. Deal with it. All caps. You made this bed. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, GM, my, my uh, poor decisions uh, are hurting me. me. Please stop. Sowing, me reaping, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Easy Does It says, any interesting new monster subcategories in Hell in the Wild? Any. Many. <laughs> Love to hear that. All. Um, it's less that there are foundational new subcategories and more that there are numerous creature families that have kind of tied abilities. There's, um, you know, there are things like the ethereal wildlife we just previewed, which are all creatures that live partially on the ethereal plane and therefore have phasing or dimensional abilities that manifest in various ways. The chameleon can eat things into its extra dimensional stomach. Uh, the bear can kind of phase in or out. Um, but there's other things too, you know, we have uh you know we have categories of creatures that sort of cluster together and they share abilities and some they look similar um there's probably a few new you know like traits in there i wouldn't know which ones those were off the top of my head though okay uh i think this will be maybe the last question here can you say anything about the wild mimic yeah uh it's it is your archetype that gains the abilities of creatures that they face in combat or otherwise experience. So it ha which are things from sort of classic abilities like render trample to uh, they also have like electrogenesis is one. I think they have like a howl as one. I think let me just double check this. Is there a ability here. called Howl of the Wild? There is not. I felt a good oh. full focus on the rest of the book. The book is not about the wild mimic, you know, it's about a lot of other things. Um, yeah, so this is one that is, that is one that also is probably one you talk to your GM a lot too, because, um, you know, it has a lot of the electrogenesis ability, for example, is like, you know, the prerequisite is not just the dedication. It's also like, you have to have seen a creature dealt electricity damage, can deal electricity damage to you and you must have, you know, survived an encounter with it. So they do kind of rely on this thing with the, with your GM, you know, putting those creatures in your in your path. Um, but then after you have that, you have the ability to, you know, make a uh, melee unarmed strike that deals electricity damage and it can like numb the creature and leave them, you know, clumsy and that kind of thing. Um, so it's kind of this mix between classical abilities like trample and cool things like, oh, they do have a petrifying gaze mimicry. You can uh, petrify them a little bit, but of course you have to have survived a, a petrifying animal or beast, right? Yeah, this reminds me of the deviant abilities from Dark Archive. Um, the aftermath feats. Maybe. Aftermath feats, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah they're kind of uh, they're similar. They're a little more um, they're a little more constrained to the archetype just because it's has a couple of other abilities, and we want it to be this very like not hitting quite so wide of a range of things, but mm. more like this is kind of your like Tarzan Blanca. Um, what's that kid from Final Fantasy? Is it Gal? You know that kind of I'm not sure I remember kind of deal. Yeah, that more that kind of thing, just because the book is a very you know, the um the aftermath feats are very cryptid focused, so they were very kind of all over the place intentionally. Whereas this mm. is the you know, I I like grew up in the wild sort of one. So it's a little more it's a little more focused around that. Okay. That's cool. All right. That's uh, really awesome. I <laughs> thank you so much for coming out and chatting with us today yeah, it was great to be here uh i i always i love and i hate these streams because it's always cool to get to talk to someone in the industry doing working on a game that i love but it's also just never enough time to talk about everything i that's <laughs> why so i miss PaizoCon. i got to talk to like mark seifter for like three four hours at at PaizoCon one time and that was like the best thing ever and i just oh i just wish i i could do that more often uh but <laughs> We appreciate you coming out, giving us your insight. I'm very excited for these books coming out. I will be making some videos on them. So, you know, uh, if if I say anything like uh, maybe like negative or interpreted negative, it's not necessarily the intention. It's always I just, know. Uh, you know, I, I like to try to put myself in the shoes of the player and give like their perspective. Yeah, and that's and that's also you know your that's also your job as a as a critic so you know that's yeah. totally fine we, we get uh, it you know <laughs> but no i appreciate everything you guys do and i'm always so excited for everything that comes out and 
Uh, I'm, I, I also want to give a cordial apology to all the players out there who are now going to have way more character ideas than they already had <laughs> after these next few books of characters you probably just won't get to play because, you know, that's tabletop we'll not be for you. So can <laughs> that's fair. I, I've been doing that. I've just been making builds <laughs> at night. Yeah, Alex is just like... falling down that dark path. And, uh, uh, man, I'm going to have more once May hits. It's going to be... It's gonna be See that's my see that's my issue with these streams is I usually just get significantly more hyped than something I was excited <laughs> for, and now my wallet's gonna hurt more. So uh, Tian Shovel Beef will be formally out in just a couple weeks, and Hell of the Wild is next month. So hopefully people won't have to wait much longer. Yeah, True. it's not too long of a wait, and I'm 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 very much excited for both of those. They're gonna be I'm, I'm... really fun reads. Waiting on my copies, my review copies, soon, hopefully, so I can start working on that. Uh, but anyway, as I said, thank you so much. Is there anything you want us to be aware of? Anything you kind of want to leave us with before we head out for today? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna continue to plug Lost Omens Tian Sha, which comes out, uh, which comes out on the 24th and is a vibrant and in-depth world guide into all kinds of Asian fantasy made by about 40 of the coolest writers in the industry, all of whom have very different views and takes and voices that I think have really come together. And I'll I'll plug Howl at a different time next month. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Uh, excellent. All right. And Alex, anything you want to leave us with uh, today for your channel? Yeah. Uh, well, if you're interested in Good old lore for for some of these tabletop games. You can swing by my channel. It's a Glue Boy, Flinkton Cam's YouTube, or just look up Glue Boy. I cover uh, Warhammer 40k. I cover uh, other grim dark settings, or just whatever I'm kind of interested in at the moment. It's kind of whatever. Today I put out a video on Vampire the Masquerade, a character known as Saulot, uh, a very complicated character, uh, and it was quite an interesting ride he's got a lot going on but uh yeah if you're interested in that go give that a go give that a watch all right and uh as for me uh stay tuned subscribe follow do whatever on whatever platform you choose there's gonna be more pathfinder stuff coming out in the coming months a lot uh i'll be doing some video uh, this this week was kind of bad for videos for me honestly and it's just because uh last week was like a big convergence of several family things like all at once in addition to everything i all the videos i tried to put out in the meantime uh i'm not being myself about too about it too much paizo is going to give me more than enough work in the next few months to to work on and uh remaster or player core 2 is going to be a big one so you know you don't want to miss out i'm going to do what i did last time where i'm just going to go and pretty much make a everything that changed videos which is fun but always a ton of work so stay tuned for that uh we'll be hopefully having another guest next month uh, i'm gonna aim for probably louise i do want to get uh uh oh no the name and uh, getting mixed up in all the names in my head uh he, he's the one he's the guy who made Pathfinder, or what the first guy uh talking about like logan or someone or i think logan bonner right yeah, logan, yeah yeah i i, I do want to get him on I, my brain's a jumbled mess of information right now <laughs> uh on at some point because i want to talk about some of his recent like projects that he's been working on he's been talking about on twitter a lot uh also want to get someone from the starfinder team i'm not super familiar with the starfinder team and so i need i need to like get some connections on that end uh yeah there's just a lot uh, we're doing a lot and and paizo's doing a lot and ah uh, but anyway that's gonna be it for us thank you all so much for watching and uh we'll go ahead and say good night good night